morning and welcome to our morning prayer on this Friday the 17th of June. Today the church commemorates Samuel and Henrietta Barnett who were social reformers in uh, the 18 and 1900s. Samuel Augustus Barnett was born in Bristol in 1844, was educated at Wadham College in Oxford and two years after his ordination he found the Charity Organisation Society. From 1873 to 1894, he was vicar of St. Jude's Whitechapel, where his unorthodox methods, including evening schools and entertainers, aroused much criticism. However, he soon became recognised as a loyal priest devoted to the religious and cultural improvement of the East End of London. In all his work, he was ably assisted by Henrietta, his wife. Henrietta Octavia Weston Rowland was born in Clapham in 1851, and before her marriage to Samuel in 1873, he'd been a co-worker with Octavia Hill. Samuel's spiritual gifts, combined with Henrietta's robust energy and assertive personality, made for a dynamic expression of the Christian faith. Samuel died on this day in Hove in 1913, and Henrietta died at Hampstead on the 10th of June 1936. So we will be uh, picking up the threads of social reform and uh, working for the uh, betterment of our society and those who are in need um, in our intercessions a little bit later on. Let's uh, spend a moment in quiet as we uh, still our hearts and minds to come before God in prayer. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Blessed are you, creator of all. To you be praise and glory forever. As your dawn renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation, may we rejoice in this day you have made. As we awake refreshed from the depths of sleep, open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St Luke, chapter 11, starting at verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be to his generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon, and see, something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah, and see, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you light with its rays. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And so a short reflection on our reading from Luke 11 by Tom Wright. The church is completely dark. It is almost midnight and the little crowd outside the west door shuffles around and stamps to keep warm in the chilly April air. Then, as the clock strikes, the fire is lit, with a sudden glow on all the watching faces. A single candle is lit from the fire. The doors swing open, the light moves forward into the pitch-black church, and the Easter celebration begins. Soon the whole place will be full of flickering, glowing candlelight, the light of God's power and love shining in the darkness of the world. Not every church celebrates Easter this way, but those that do will have no difficulty making the connections that hold together a rather confusing collection of sayings in this passage. The context is still, of course, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, like a candle going forwards into the darkness. 
When the light comes, it scatters the darkness. But what if you were rather enjoying the darkness, able to get on with unseen or evil purposes you had? Light brings hope and new possibility, but it also brings judgment. Light symbolises new life in the face of the darkness of death, but it also shows up that darkness for what it is. These sayings, then, though full of hope, are also filled with warnings of judgment. Jesus is, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem is constantly saying in one way or another that God's light will, cut, will shine out and expose the darkness that had taken hold of the hearts and minds of his contemporaries. It all begins with a sign, the sign of Jonah. Jonah is an almost comic figure in the Old Testament, the prophet who runs away, the problem passenger thrown into the sea, the dinner the whale can't stomach, and the hothead who gets cross with God over a withered plant. In between, though, he told the people of Nineveh to repent, never thinking they would listen and obey, but he was wrong. They did, whether or not, as in Matthew's version of the story, because they had heard about his escapade with the sea and the whale, or whether simply because of the power of his message. Now here is Jesus, anything but a comic figure, telling his own people it's time to repent, and they ignore him. Here is Jesus with a greater wisdom than even the legendary Solomon, and his own people don't listen. There is a straight line from this point that leads to the moment when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, because unlike Nineveh, it has ignored the warnings, refused the way of peace, and thereby sealed its own fate. Luke's reader, meanwhile, is left to ponder the way in which Jesus speaks of the foreigners, the Queen of the South and the people of Nineveh, who will rise at the judgment. The two words used to mean rise are both regular early Christian words for the resurrection. Luke expects his readers to know about the coming re resurrection of the dead and of the great judgment that will take place. The light of Easter is the light of judgment as well as hope. When we read the sayings about light, then, they speak of more than general wisdom or spiritual illumination. To begin with, Jesus warns that the light has come into the midst of Israel, and it is designed not to remain hidden, but to shine all around. Then, changing the image, he gives another warning, more cryptic for us and, and easy to miss. To begin with, it looks like a rather obvious saying about human life. If the eye is in working order, Jesus seems to be saying you can see where you are going. But if it isn't, you can't. So watch out and in case you light, your light, that is your eye, becomes darkened. Now, clearly, Jesus isn't giving advice about protecting your physical eyes, nor about the spiritual dangers of, of looking at the wrong things. Nor, I think, is he just speaking of the spiritual insight of individuals. The passage makes more sense especially when Luke has placed it, is a warning to the generation. They must watch out in case they fail to see the light that was standing there in their midst. Where does all this leave us today then? The light of Christ has been in the world for 2,000 years. Are we any better at embracing it for ourselves than Jesus' contemporaries were? For that matter, are we shining this light to the world so that they can see the one who is greater than Solomon, greater than Jonah? Challenging words indeed for us all this morning. We say the Benedictus together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. And so let's pray together. We pray for those who are facing destitution and poverty around the world. 
We ask that our economies and societies may be reordered to ensure that they meet the needs of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who offer a listening ear to those who need to share their pains and sufferings. We ask that they may be bringers of consolation. We pray too for all those who are working to promote reconciliation and understanding around the world. May they bring peace wherever it is needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who go hungry and thirsty. We ask that each and every person may be able to eat healthily and drink clean water. We pray for all those who are working for justice around the world, especially in food and water. We ask that they might shine your light upon the darkness of our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who have... Uh, whose plight has been forgotten during this pandemic and who feel more marginalised than ever. We ask that they may be given the assistance they need and feel that they are not alone. We pray for the world that we envision now and after the pandemic. We ask that this might be a moment of change in which our societies are reordered according to your priorities and your justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We unite our prayers with the whole world. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Collect for today. Almighty and everlasting God, who has given us your servants grace by the confession of the truth faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship in the unity, keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defined, defended from all adversities through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And so let us pray with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and for ever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's been wonderful as ever to pray with you this morning. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you again soon. Do check in uh, on Sunday for our recorded service on YouTube, which will be this week, a Compline for Evening Prayer. God bless. <laughs>